handle the truth. The Denise Simon Experience. The Truth Matrix. Vetting, exposing, drilling down to the truth. Rolling Thunder, this is Hitman, see ya. Hitman, this is Rolling Thunder, see ya now. The Denise Simon Experience. Exposing politics, lies, demagoguery, spin, fraud. Great to suppress, Mike Charlie, 435-921. Great to mark, Mike Charlie, 4 7 3 9 8 9 out. Promoting individual situational awareness. Question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark spoke on the deck. Simon Experience. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Denise Simon Experience. All right, we're going to spend some time uh, doing law stuff and court stuff. And, and this is kind of important because of where um, the headlines are really taking us when it comes to what happens at the lower courts and then what happens when you get into um, the Supreme Court. So. Jonathan Wood, who's a previous guest here uh, on the Denise Simon Experience with the Pacific Legal Foundation, has been kind enough to join us to talk on the matter of the Chevron deference or the Chevron doctrine. And I hope, and I know that he will, Jonathan will help us try and wade through that. And it's kind of interesting, Jonathan, that I actually heard an attorney early, early this morning um, talking about it on the on uh, Fox News. So um, thank you, Jonathan, for being the willing um, person to come on the Denise Simon Experience and talk about this Chevron deference. Um, of course. Thank you for having me. Now, it, uh, and it, it's kind of interesting because I was actually thinking this the other day. If you've got, a, if you've got a, a legal case that's coming before really any court and whatever law that you go to apply to it that's either – uh, to follow it or that it's been broken and, you know, whatever that is, if the law itself is ambiguous, then it puts the judges or the court in a tough spot. And so if they have the case, they have a decision to make. How they apply it or they throw it out or suspend or rewrite it or do something, right? I mean, there are some <laughs> there's there's a lot of moving parts in this. Did I say that right, Jonathan? Uh, that, that's right. I mean, ambu ambiguity is ultimately in the eye of the beholder, but our Constitution places the responsibility in the courts to say what the law is. The purpose of the courts in our constitutional system is to ensure fundamental fairness so that some neutral arbiter is deciding cases between the American people and federal agencies. The problem with Chevron is that it eliminates that neutral, fair process and says that the agencies get to write the rules, they get to interpret the rules, and when it comes time for litigation, the courts have to defer to whatever the agency sa says. Uh, and that has a huge impact on the outcome of actual cases. When deference doesn't apply, agencies only win about 40% of the cases they, they litigate. When defer deference applies, they win 80% of those cases. So it just completely shifts the scales away from the fairness that we expect from our courts. Okay. Um, yes. And I see that I'm looking at, I looked at, I don't know, five or six things this morning here. And not only that, when I was looking at some cases, some of which Pacific legal was, um, in or helping with, but I guess the question becomes, let's say in the, in the instance of the clean water act or, you know, something coming out of the EPA, if there is a law, law is one thing, but then beyond the law, the agencies agencies start applying these regulations and those regulations are they necessarily considered law um, when it comes to some kind of a court battle then Jonathan yes and the question the court should ask is is this regulation consistent with the law that Congress uh, passed the Constitution gives the sole lawmaking power to Congress not to, to federal agencies the agency should be limited to implementing the laws as written by Congress. And unfortunately, under the Chevron doctrine, 
and, and other rules favoring administrative agencies that we have today, the agencies basically get to do whatever they want and oh, to wow. write whatever sort of regulations they wish. Um, when I'm asked about, you know, why do we care? What is the Chevron deference from people who aren't interested or have a background in law? I, the way I explain it is that the, the rule, of course, is to ensure fundamental fairness. You should think about it the way you would think about, like, raising your kids. If you have two kids that want to split a cookie, most people would say, okay, one of you gets to cut the cookie, the other gets to pick which half they want. Chevron basically means that the agencies get to cut the cookie and they get to make their pick, and you're left with whatever crumb the agency decides to be generous with. All right, we get that one. Good job, Jonathan. We get with that one we get. All right, the great, great analogy. So what you're really doing then is is saying they would have to rely certainly to apply it evenly perhaps and sometimes that's not even the case is under case law or precedence correct That's right so right now for, as an example PLF has a petition before the US Supreme Court that 17 states have asked the court to take as an opportunity to clarify or overrule Chevron and that's one of, this case is a clear example of what we mean by the the problem Congress passed a statute in the 80s that gave a few specific powers to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to um, recover the sea otters in Southern California while also preventing negative harms to, to fishermen and others. The agency was fine with that deal for the first 20 or so years and then later on decided, well, we like the parts of the statute that benefit us. We don't like the parts of the statute that limit us. So we're now going to reinterpret our power to mean wh whatever we want it to be. And the Ninth Circuit bizarrely said, that's fine. It doesn't matter what the law Congress actually wrote says. Unless Congress anticipated what an agency would try to get away with and clearly and expressly prevented it, then the agency can do whatever it wants. And that changes the nature of our government completely. Before, we thought that Congress had the power and agencies could only do whatever Congress said they could. Now, under the Ninth Circuit's rule, Agencies have unlimited power and can do anything that Congress hasn't yet stopped them from doing. So when law is written, then, Jonathan, it kind of goes like this. I mean, you've got, uh, you've got all these congressional aides, and Congress has lawyers all over the place. And then I'm sure that things are swept into, you know, maybe even some advice from the Department of Justice or, you know, outside legal organizations that are hired on as contractors to look at law and that can either work or not work so if a law is about to be passed um, there is a chance minute as it may be that you've got some legal minds that says this law is ambiguous you better say this you can't take this you can't do that does that even happen of course and that's the primary reason why our congressmen have so many staff and why the, the federal government participates in the legislating process. Rout it is routine for a federal agency, the Department of Justice, to weigh in on a proposed statute that will affect uh, their work. And here in, in our Sea Otter case, that's precisely what happened. Uh, the Department of Interior effectively helped write the law that was enacted and agreed at, at the beginning on what the law meant, but decided to change its mind because later on it suited its interest to expand its power. <laughs> it almost seems then that if that's the case, there needs to, and I don't even know, begin, you would go back and say, okay, let's go look at the Department of Interior, let's go look at EPA, let's go look at agriculture, and, because, I mean, this affects personal lives out here in the world and personal careers, like when it comes to landowners or farmers or any of those kinds, and review some of these things that they need to clean this up or fix that. Um, that would that would be a Herculean test that nobody would do, right? I, I completely disagree. If the court overrules or limits Chevron, it'll force the agencies to go back, okay. look at the statutes they're implementing, okay. and follow the law. If they want the law to be changed, they can then go to Congress and say, this is what the law should actually you know. be. And that's precisely what our Constitution says is supposed to happen. The, what we can't have is what we've had the last few decades, where agencies are basically making it up as they go to suit their own interests, and the American people are completely shut out. So, um, where does abdication of the court fit in? Is is there bias in this? Is there restraint? Is there activism? 
to kind of help us with that because we hear this nonsense of legislating from the bench and in in, in some cases it, it really does happen and in other cases uh, you know it's argued to prevent that from happening when people are following you know the constitutional restraints correct so generally whenever you hear someone refer to judicial activism what they really mean is a judge issued a decision I don't like there's really no principled way to distinguish a judge doing their job correctly and being activist or restrained. What we want is for judges to interpret and apply the law as written, whether the law is of the Constitution or a statute enacted by Congress. And Chevron takes the courts out of the business of doing their job. Instead, the courts have basically said, agencies, you do it for us. Whatever you say the law means, unless you're just being patently absurd, you know, we're just going to defer to you and whatever you say is fine. And that's not the way judges are supposed to act. When they have parties before them, they're not supposed to put a thumb on the scale on the side of one so one party or another. And for the last 20 years, there's been an extremely heavy thumb on the scale favoring the government. Oh, yeah, I can I can certainly see that. So um, from a from a landowner standpoint, um, uh, the poor little landowner, he, he he thinks he's complying to these regulations or, you know, the additional annexes to the law because of what these agencies are doing. Yet, that interpretation or compliance is very different than of what the agency's intent was with it. And intent may not be spelled out right. So the landowner is necessarily going to lose almost every time, right? Well, if it's up to the agency to make up the rules as it goes along, including after the fact, then I think it's exactly what will happen. That's why it's vital that courts play the role they're intended to play and fairly look at, okay, what did the law actually say? Did the, the landowner or person follow that law? And if so, agency, leave them alone. And our Sea Otter case, again, is a perfect example of that. The law written by Congress forbids the Department of Interior from criminally prosecuting fishermen for doing their jobs. But under the agency's decision to reinterpret that law, that provision no longer applies. And so today, a person can be thrown in jail under the agency's interpretation if they simply accidentally drive a boat too close to a sea otter, despite the fact that Congress clearly forbade that result. And that is just fundamentally unfair, and it is impossible for an ordinary American to have any hope of complying with the law and understanding the law if what's written down in the statute books passed by Congress counts for nothing. Oy vey. Um, all right, so <laughs> you said that, what, 17 states have signed on for some uh, clarity on this uh, Chevron doctrine, is that right? Chevron deference? That's right. That's right. Last week, 17 states filed an amicus brief urging the court to grant our case and finally consider whether to limit or overrule Chevron. And that is a powerful signal to the court about the importance of this issue and the importance of taking this case to finally engage in that, that reconsideration. States don't regularly file amicus briefs urging the court to take the case. And when they do, it's usually one or two or three states with some immediate direct interest. But this is a constitu constitutional issue that affects every issue you might care about and every state in the country. And the fact that so many are willing to sign on and say, take this case and finally fix the problem is a powerful signal to the court. And you're, the, the court in this case is the Supreme Court, correct? Yes. So this would really make the, the judge's job decision easier. There'd almost be less argument, correct? If it, if it works? Um, well, the, the job of actually interpreting the law and, and uh -huh. applying it would be more difficult because the courts would have to start doing that job again. And for, frankly, for the last few decades, courts have been asleep at the switch and just said, okay, we know this is what we're supposed to be doing, but we're not going to do it anymore. Agencies, you do it for us. Okay, I see what um, you're saying. Okay. So it, it kind of says, um, oh, man, I even, how do you argue that then, Jonathan? Um, I mean, do you, do you say, do, do the, the judges go back to the government and say, you got to go clean up your act here? Um, 
because we're we're not going to uh, essentially accept these cases because of the ambiguity of the law. Did I get that right? I'm not even sure how you'd have, how do you argue that one. You are you would argue it the same way you'd argue any other sort of case. Administrative cases over the last few decades have been fundamentally different from every other. If a court were interpreting a contract, for instance, they would look at what does the contract say, um, and, and it would just interpret it and apply the contract between the parties suing. But unfortunately, the courts haven't been doing that with statutes. If Chevron were overturned or limited, courts would go back to doing the job entrusted them by the Constitution. Say, okay, what did Congress actually say the law is? What is this? provision of a statute actually mean, and whatever it means, we're going to enforce it, whether that benefits the agency in this case or is against the agency in this case. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the way the law is supposed to work. That will not only benefit the courts by getting them to reassert themselves and perform their proper constitutional function, but it'd also be good for Congress. If you take the Ninth Circuit's decision that agencies can do whatever they want unless expressly prevented by Congress, how is Congress supposed to ever, ever work with such a rule? How can it anticipate every novel claim an agency might try to, to dream up and for a statute that might be in place for 100 years? Basically, the only way to preserve Congress's role in our constitutional system is to make clear that it is at the top. Agencies only have the power that Congress gives to them. Uh, does Congress get to argue or play a role, I guess, in these 17 states? I mean, this almost sounds like a class action suit. Um, you know, does does Congress have any kind of a, a role to play in this case slash argument? Uh, certainly it, it can. Um, congressmen and senators have filed amicus briefs with the U.S. Supreme Court okay. before. They haven't at, at the petition stage, but obviously could if the court granted the case on the merits. And Congress has been trying to fix this problem itself for a very long time. It has proposed legislation to uh, get rid of Chevron deference, to change the way agencies adopt regulations to ensure some measure of democratic accountability. As you can imagine, agencies have been fighting those efforts tooth and nail, and so, so far they haven't been enacted. But having the courts restore the law to its proper place and limit agency authority will allow Congress to once again reassert itself. 17 states, Jonathan. Why not 50 states? Well, as I was saying earlier, getting even one state to find a freeze at the petition stage is it's difficult because it's not a case that they're directly involved in. Um, so if you can get any sort of state interest in, in an amicus brief urging the Supreme Court to take a case, that is an impressive signal to the court. The fact that we have more than a dozen is really, really impressive. Very few cases uh, get that sort of state support because people are busy and have other interests and other priorities. The fact that this is so important that 17 states are asking the court to devote its limited time to this issue is a powerful signal. As I'm sure you know, the Supreme Court takes very few cases every year. Mm -hmm. Despite the, There are tens of thousands of, of petitions sent to the court every year, but they only hear about 80 cases. So states obviously take that into consideration. If, and if the, so many states say this is one that's worth it, that's a really powerful signal to the court. The one that affects us little people out here in the world is Obamacare. When Justice Roberts wrote the decision and said that the uh, Affordable Care Act was essentially a tax, and that wasn't even really part of the question, um, did this Chevron deference thing, in your opinion, apply there? It did not because that was a, a constitutional interpretation issue. Um, and, and the Chief Justice was applying different rules. But in subsequent Obamacare cases, Chevron has played a very important role, and the Chief Justice has actually been using those cases to limit Chevron deference. Um, so in a case dealing with the, the ability for the government to subsidize exchanges that weren't established by the states a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. Chief Justice carved out an exception for really big questions and said, basically said that the agency only has authority to change the really fundamental issue of a statute if Congress clearly gives that authority. But courts should assume that Congress deals with the really big problems, and it leads to agencies only the, the issues on the margin. And that has been an important development in the law that has helped to shift some of that power from federal agencies back to Congress. Ooh, 
it must be fun to kind of sit around and and hear you guys discuss some of these decisions and why even first of all a court took a, a case and then didn't and then once they did with these opinions you, <laughs> you lawyers just might have a a great time going through these opinions and and kind of picking them apart is that right Oh, absolutely. This this stuff is fun. And if the court were to grant this case and to finally reconsider Chevron, that would be a fascinating case just to watch. Uh, because so many vitally important constitutional issues and issues of democratic accountability um, hinge on the relationship between the American people and federal agencies. And so this this would be you know one of the biggest cases the court has heard in years, perhaps decades. Wow. Um, and it would be fascinating to see how, particularly since we're about to get a new justice, this, this yes. could be one of the early cases and early signals for what sort of justice we're going to have for the next three decades. Uh, well, you've got Senator Grassley who is um, pushing for uh, recording or uh, having TV cameras in the Supreme Court. That might be a good one to have, right? <laughs> I don't think that's likely to happen. Uh, it's no, up I don't to the court either. whether it has whether it has cameras in. Congress can't do anything about that, um, and I don't think the court's likely to go there anytime soon. But you never know. I, I certainly think it would be interesting to the American people to get to see at least some of the major cases that are argued before the court. Especially when there's only like a thirty-minute argument on each side. Is that? A, I mean, I would think in some cases that's not enough. Especially maybe when it comes to the Chevron deference, right? Well, most cases are really decided on the basis of the briefs that the parties submit. Everyone, including the judges, seem to agree that oral argument rarely changes the outcome of a case. Uh -huh. Most of the time, what you've written down will have explained the issues adequately to the judges. Um, so it's the rare case where, where oral argument really makes an, a big difference in the outcome, but it is still nonetheless extremely interesting in finding out what issues concern the judges, where they're thinking, um, and, and how to shape the argument to fit their their perspective. So the oral argument is really just for some kind of clarity and sometimes even for theater. Yes. Uh, we, we joke among lawyers that the primary reason to have oral argument is to stoke the egos of lawyers. Um, um, because that's the part you see in the movies. That's the part that's fun. <laughs> um, it can absolutely affect outcomes. It can be an important, serious it, it is a serious uh, part of, of litigating, um, but the reality is most of the work is done in the office, writing the briefs, and the courts considering those briefs. So when we hear that somebody, you know, was was a uh, clerk for such and such, that's really where all, all this this work is done, right? Uh, cer certainly, clerks play an extremely important role, especially at the Supreme Court. They make the initial review of every petition and make recommendations to the justice whether to hear a particular case. Um, so obviously those brilliant young attorneys play a, a vital role. But ultimately, it's the justice's responsibility to decide what cases to hear and how to decide them. And that's a role they take very seriously. Jonathan, we're just, Jonathan Wood, we're just so thankful um, for your time here on this. It, it's very, very fascinating because, I mean, it's kind of like a black hole on what happens in some of these courtrooms. And you've done a remarkable job to help us out and, and, and explain it to us. So, Jonathan Wood, um, big applause to you, and thanks for coming on the Denise Simon Experience. And ladies and gentlemen, there's more coming your way. about to join Don Nguyen, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Nguyen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Nguyen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Nguyen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. Check the Talk America Radio schedules for showtimes at talkamericaradio.us. 
Let me talk to you black people. When you vote for blacks and put them in office under the banner of the Democrat Party, please explain to me what black people get as a result. This was not a nap that we have been taking. We are in a coma. You know what the interesting thing about pensions is? That's today's money given to people who ain't doing nothing for you today. Get off that black Democrat tit that they've been sucking on. Your country is being stolen from you, and the promise is being stolen from your children, and they're telling you it's all right, while the rest of the world is trying to lap us. Well, why are we doing so poorly? Two words, teachers unions. Are you kidding me? Black Man Thinking, Monday nights, 9 p.m. Hi, this is Donna Fiducia, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. For 28 years, I was in the mainstream media, most recently as an anchor at the Fox News Channel. No more. Ladies and gentlemen, the mainstream media has completely failed the American people. Radio networks like Talk America Radio will not fail you. Radio shows like Cowboy Logic Radio will not fail you. Check out the entire roster of over 60 weekly radio shows by visiting TalkAmericaRadio.us. That's TalkAmericaRadio.us. We're hanging here with this law stuff, and we're hanging here with this judge thing. Um, hat tip to Jonathan Wood. And uh, Mark Miller was with us, um, I think, last week, and thank him for being back with us. Because um, we're going to talk about Brett Kavanaugh, not to be uh, confused with Matt Kavanaugh, who I, uh, I know that some people have actually made that confusion thing already. But um, Trump's nominee to uh, replace Justice Kennedy on the, on the, on the bench. And so, um, Mark Miller, thank you for being with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, we were just chatting here a little bit offline. I'm, I get these emails, I'm sure some of the same ones that you get, on, uh, I guess, critiquing uh, Kavanaugh's career. And there's a lot here to critique. There's a lot of history here. So you kind of have to weed through all of this. What a fascinating job that this Senate Judiciary Committee is going through right now, especially with 300 opinions. Did I get some of that right, Mark? That's, that sounds about right. That's about the number I've seen. Yes, Denise. <laughs> God. And, and this... let me ask, Denise, I don't want to interrupt you, but are you saying some of your listeners think that Matt Kavanaugh, the former NFL football player, is the nomination? Yes. And, I, and I guess that sounds crazy, but on the other hand, Byron Wizard White was on the Supreme Court for a number of years, and he played in the NFL in 1938. So he would not be, if Matt Kavanaugh was the nomination, he wouldn't be the first NFL football player on the high court. <laughs> That's funny. Thank There's you. some obscure arcana for you. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, I personally, and I generally don't offer personal assessments doing radio interviews, but I personally, on this choice, give an 8 of 10 instead of a 10 of 10. And I, I think that I might be kind of uh, mainstream in that assessment. Um, on the other hand, and, and you tell me where I'm wrong, because I, I, I love this is a sandbox that I'm way out of my league on. I believe that Kavanaugh was chosen because he knows and, and Trump and all of his you know, advice and consent counsel on this know that whoever Trump put in there they were going to be tarred and feathered through this entire process. But I believe Kavanaugh is probably got the thickest skin and is ready for that fight. Surely he's reading the headlines and watching the news on Roe versus Wade and Obamacare and, you know, immigration, and all these things. And he's really up for that. You agree? Yeah, I think absolutely that 
Judge Kavanaugh, having gone through a very contentious nomination process, you know, over a decade ago, is ready as ready as you can be, I suppose. You know, obviously, Robert Bork probably thought he was ready, and Doug Ginsburg, uh, before um, Kennedy got the nod, was the second nominee for the what ended up being the Kennedy seat. They probably thought they were ready too, and Merrick Garland, I'm sure, thought he was ready, but. Yes, I would think of the potential nominations that President Trump was looking at, the people on his shortlist, Judge Kavanaugh certainly has been through the fire in D.C. previously. He's got quite the resume, and um, (laughs) he's been through legally and with his um, participation as a lawyer in some of these cases, he's gone through some very dark times in our history. A recent, fairly recent history in his legal travels, correct? Yeah, he, you know, if if you put aside his judicial career when he was in, in private practice, he had a number of interesting uh, involvements in national level uh, legal cases. Uh, whether it be he volunteered to help the family uh, in in Miami in the Elian Gonzalez situation, where Janet Reno's Department of Justice decided to remove a child with guns drawn from a home in Miami, which I don't know where I come from. I don't see that as the rule of law when children are removed at gunpoint in that famous picture. And so I would personally would applaud um, Mr. Kavanaugh and Judge Kavanaugh for having gotten involved, having personally chosen to involve himself in that dispute. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he was also involved in the recount, in uh, the, on the infamous 2000 recount fight between President Bush Gore. and uh, Vice President Gore. So he is, he is certainly a, a, a person who doesn't shy from legal disputes um i've received outside of you know from just other little pundit people out there some of their emails uh saying that you know uh, kavanaugh is a swamp creature and that goes back to the whole vince foster ken star thing and then he's uh you know he was a in the bush white house and that his wife was even um uh, Bush's secretary. So then we have the swamp attachment that we're putting on this. Um, and he's he's going to have to necessarily, it'll be fascinating to listen to the to the confirmation hearings on who goes down that path on the Republican side of the of, of the Judiciary Committee and then what the Democrats are going to say. I know I, we can predict what the Democrats' questions are going to be, right? They're all going to be um, Roe versus Wade and gun rights and health care and that kind of stuff, correct? Yeah, I, I would think we're going to see a lot of grandstanding a, mm-hmm. at the hearings, which would certainly be par for the course for the Judiciary Committee. Um, then we have the other side, the Republican side, and they're going to probably ignore questions on Travelgate and Vince Foster and the the Bush Gore case, right? Well, I think I think like you said, Denise. You know, uh, some people on the right side of the aisle who are criticizing the pick or calling him, as you said, a swamp creature. And, and it just makes me think just more generally, when my, my, when my opponents are labeling me with a name rather than attacking me on the merits, I know I'm winning. And so if people don't like Judge Kavanaugh's decisions, they should point out what he did wrong in decision making. And you will see some people on the right side of the aisle picking out certain decisions they don't like. And, and I think that's the right way to criticize any judge. And, and vice versa, um, on the left side of the aisle, the same thing. Rather than try and force the uh, nominee to be pinned down on a future case that where the judge doesn't really know what the facts of that case may be because they're grandstanding, they should instead say, well, you said X in this case. What did you mean by that? Mm-hmm. And, for example, when a judge says, as Judge Kavanaugh said in his prior hearings, that Roe is the law of the land, well, and I'd have to enforce it. Well, he's speaking to the fact of his role at the circuit court of appeals level in the federal court system. There's no question that a lower court judge has to follow a higher court's precedent. And I've seen some people criticize him for that for that statement, but there's an easy way to rebut that. And I, I think that is the right way to attack Kavanaugh. And unfortunately, in our, you know, 24-hour-a-day news cycle, and then, of course, the Twitterverse, it's a constant attack, not by on substance, but rather on with name-calling. Now, um, I don't know if it was Diane Feinstein or Schumer or whoever it was, but they they want to be able to ask 
uh, Kavanaugh during the confirmation hearings on his personal position on issues like Obamacare and abortion and blah, 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 meaning hypotheticals, which um, can the chairman, Chuck Grassley, go, no, we're not going to do that uh, because it has really nothing. It's not germane to the job. Um, or do you think it should be allowed? Well, whether the questions are allowed or not, I think any good judge is going to answer a question like that by saying my personal views have no bearing on my role as a judge. My role as a judge is to interpret the text of the Constitution and the statutes that are at issue. And what I think personally has no bearing. Some people on either side of the aisle might prefer to have a judge who will reach the policy results they want and then just find a way to get there, find an interpretive method to get there. But that's not what a good judge does. A good judge adheres to the text and original understanding, whether it be the Constitution, the original understanding of the Constitution, what Justice Scalia used to call originalism, or the text of the statutes, which we can call textualism, and Scalia would call it that as well. And that's these, you know, as David Brooks said in the New York Times, that's what these judges are that are being nominated by President Trump. They are going to follow the letter of the law, the text of the law, and they're not just going to decide the result they want and then find a way to get there. So whether it be Gorsuch or whether it be uh, Kavanaugh in this case or Amy Coney Barrett or Judge Kethledge or Judge Hardiman, the other finalists that, that were supposedly the finalists, they're going to interpret the law in such a way that we can trust they're not just trying to reach the policy result that they personally want. We don't want people like that on the bench. Those are people who should be elected to be our elected officials to pass the law. They tell us what they think, and then we elect them or we don't elect them. Um, now, let me ask you what, what your thoughts are on the composition. For the, for the sake of argument, Kavanaugh has been confirmed. And it is now October the 1st, and he he's now has an office, and he gets to wear the black robe. Okay. Um, so we have Ginsburg, and we have uh, Kagan and we have Sotomayor who generally what do they call the Constitution a living breathing document that you know has to adapt um, but Kavanaugh is a textualist and, and he's going to go no 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 is, is when, when court is not in session and they're hanging around in the break room um, does this begin to change the tone or the relationships with the judges between each other? I mean, their, their friendships and the quality of the conversations, legal conversations that they may have? Well, I, I never had the privilege of working at the Supreme Court. I did clerk for a lower level federal judge, but I didn't have the opportunity to work at the U.S. Supreme Court, even though I may have sought it. But certainly, you know, you can speculate that the way they get along is affected by their decision-making. But, you know, I don't know how much stock you can really put in that. Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were on different polls, different side, diametrically yeah. opposed, yet they were close friends. I have a book here about Justice Scalia, Scalia Speaks, where Justice Ginsburg wrote the introduction and went on and on about her friend, uh, Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia has a famous quote that there, you can be friends with anyone of the other political persuasion uh, just because you know, some very good people have some very bad ideas, I think is the way the quote went. And <laughs> a lot of people assume he was talking about uh, the notorious RBG there. I don't know if that's who he meant. But the bottom line is, in America, in the United States, I would hope that regardless of the fact that we disagree on uh, political outcomes or decision-making outcomes in the courts, that we can put that aside and be friends because we all – people of good faith in America all want the same thing, which is to see America prosper. Um, we heard a couple of days ago, um, Mark, that uh, John Kyle was going to be the Sherpa of record ta taking Kavanaugh up and down the offices of the, of the Hart building to have, you know, these conversations with Kavanaugh. Um, but day one, it was Vice President Pence. I would say that a lot of the decisions on who's going to vote for who uh, for confirmation, I mean, who is going to, how they're going to vote for confirmation of Kavanaugh happens in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. And the, the televised confirmation piece is, is just theater. Did I get that right? Well, it certainly is theater. And so you never know what the actors will do. 
But, yeah, I agree with you that chances are decisions are going to be made behind closed doors. I continue to adhere to the crazy idea that this is not even going to be a very controversial uh, uh, nomination and confirmation process because ultimately um, you can't label Justice Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh uh, as a zealot. He has, if, you know, at the D.C. Circuit, he's doing the kinds of cases that come before the U.S. Supreme Court, and at times he would side with um, – say, people who might perceive themselves to be on the left side of the aisle, at times he's on the right side of the aisle. He's ultimately just going where the law takes him. He has said that he sees the proper role for executive agencies, and occasionally that it's, it's proper for judges to defer to those agencies as they implement rules that are intended to implement the laws that Congress has written. And so he, he can't be called a zealot. In fact, I did an interview recently on a liberal uh, website a liberal news organization, that they let it off that way. They said he can't be labeled a zealot. And, and I, I think that's true. And the, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans each have their own game to play, but ultimately they're going to have a hard time you know, making anything stick to Kavanaugh. At least I'd be surprised if they do. He's a mainstream modern American jurist in America 2018 and the mainstream of legal thinking. He's been on the high, the, what people call the farm team for the U.S. Supreme Court for 12 years. Mm. And it's going to be difficult to derail his confirmation process. Well, you know, as I said earlier, he, he certainly knows the machinery of Washington, D.C. And he knows the, how contentious it is, regardless of, you know, who he's standing in company with. I mean, things, everybody seems to want a grandstand and posture. And I think he's he's figured out that, that whole equation. Um, I think he should do okay. Uh, meaning I think he should do well. Um, but he, he's actually argued a case before the Supreme Court and lost that case. Is somebody going to seize on that one? You know, again, I, it's true he, he lost the case. Um, I did, in fact, I saw the, just the headline this morning about that. I, I just don't think when the man has almost 300 opinions under his belt that the fact that he may have lost one case is going to really make a dime's worth of difference in the grand scheme of things. It's going to be, if they're going to derail them, it's going to be because they trump something up, no pun intended, and make a, a mountain out of a molehill that somehow uh, escapes and becomes something that you know eats the nomination. I just, it seems exceedingly unlikely after the, the last several nominations we've had, putting aside really Harriet Myers, which was sort of sui generis. Um, you know, the, the presidents have, by and large, been able to get who they wanted, other than when President Obama nominated Garland because Mitch McConnell was able to control the Republican senators, uh, which to me, I wouldn't have bet on even a dollar on that happening, and to hold the line and say, let's see if the Democrats win the election. And, and, and the beauty of that was Mitch McConnell was saying, look, if the Democrats win, then they'll get whoever they want. They can, re they can re-nominate Garland, or they can nominate someone else who might even be... Uh, Someone the Republicans would have liked even less, and um, but generally, a president in President Trump's shoes hasn't had a, had a problem getting who they want, even if it breaks down partisan on partisan lines, when they have the majority of the Senate under on their side. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Mark Miller at Pacific Legal on uh, the nominee uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Um, we explain for us, Mark, if you can, about seniority on on the Supreme Court bench. I don't think the listeners necessarily understand that there is a seniority in who gets to assign cases for opinions. Um, can you kind of explain that for us? You never cease to amaze me, Denise. Having been on your show many times, the the detailed knowledge you have of these Aww. issues. I mean, that, frankly, other than in the most obscure legal wonk websites, you're never even going to hear that. But yes, you're right that the um, senior most judge uh, on who's in the majority gets to assign who writes the majority opinion. And I think the, the chief judge, if the chief judge is among the majority, I think maybe how it works. Um, but I wouldn't put money on that. I could be wrong on that. But so it, it's generally going to be um, up to Chief Justice Roberts when he's in the majority to assign an opinion, and if if he's on the, if he's in the dissenting side, like in a case like Wayfair, the internet tax case that was decided mm -hmm. recently, and where he uh, was on the losing side, um, then it'll be the senior most judge in the Wayfair case, Justice Thomas, was the senior most judge who was ruling 
in favor of the ability of states to tax out-of-state retailers who sell you stuff over the Internet. And when, when you live in a state, even if that company, Amazon or what have you, doesn't have a presence in your state. So there, Clarence Thomas got to assign the opinion. And um, so that's how it works. And so it's going to be rare anytime soon that Kavanaugh is assigning any opinions. But I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Kavanaugh, once he's confirmed, being assigned important administrative law cases, because that really is um, one of his specialty areas as a judge on the D.C. Circuit. Well, I asked that because, uh, you know, I, I, he being a, a newbie on the court wouldn't necessarily be assigned um, that task to, to write an opinion. I mean, he, they certainly get, you know, a vote, um, but it would it may be some time before he, he's tapped on the shoulder for that, um, except in maybe a, an exceptional case, as you just said, um, when and it comes they do to- break them up. Like they, I think they try to spread the work out. And in fact, you'll see the real experts much beyond me, um, not an expert at all in terms of the assignment process, but th- they will say, okay, there are three cases left from October that were argued. And this justice, this justice, and this justice haven't written an opinion yet. And since we think these two are in the majority on those two cases, they're probably in on those two, and we think this one is in the majority on the other, He's, he or she is probably writing this one. And they usually tend to be right, particularly at the end of the term this year. Most people guessed that were these level experts that Janus was going to be written by Justice Alito, just by, num- by who had written other opinions that came out of the same month of argument. They were right. Um, most people thought Judge Chief Justice Roberts was writing a case called Carpenter, which was an important Fourth Amendment case in terms of seizing your cell phone record, mm. uh, and they were they were right. And so the, uh, these people are very good at gaming out who's writing the opinions. And so it's not just seniority, but ra- also um, they spread the work out. So you you will see him writing opinions. Just it may not be the most exciting opinions, unless they do something unusual uh, or unexpected, perhaps a little bit. Uh, the, there's a case called Demaya from the last term that I'm thinking of where Justice Gorsuch sided with the liberals in an opinion that Scalia probably could have written himself if he was still on the court uh, about application of immigration laws to immigrants where the law that's being applied is somewhat vague um, and it's effectively acting as if it's a criminal law being applied. And uh, for due process concerns in terms of notice and the inability of of an immigrant to know that this law would apply to him, arguably, Gorsuch said it couldn't apply to him. Scalia likely he was Gorsuch was applying a Scalia uh, opinion when he reached that result, and Gorsuch was with the liberals, and and then there was a, dis, a strong dissent, if I recall correctly, written by Judge Thomas, Justice Thomas, disagreeing with the way Gorsuch was applying the law, textualist, both textualists, but reaching mm-hmm. different results. I mean, it, it's all so so fascinating. Um, I mean, it really, it really is. During these confirmation hearings and in these, you know, one-on-one meetings, um, when they meet with the members of the Judiciary Committee, um, I don't believe that Kavanaugh will be on the defensive at all when he goes up against a Kamala Harris or a Cory Booker or a, you know, Diane Feinstein, whoever it may be. Um, But I would say that he will hold his own such if there is some critique that he needs to make by virtue of their challenging questions to him going through this little vetting process, advice and consent process, that he would not shy away from kind of throwing the (laughs) spirit of, of the contentiousness back into their lap. Um, I think he's that fearless. Would you agree? Well, um, <laughs> fe- whether he's that fearless, I, 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 again, alluding to what I said earlier about the fact that he he, um, he got himself involved in the Elian Gonzalez dispute and the, the election dispute of 2000, he does appear to be, or at least in his younger years, was a fearless man. But whether uh, in that situation it would it would behoove him to act on that fearlessness, if he's going to, I would guess he'd be very subtle about it, not unlike the way yeah. Gorsuch was, right. where, you know, it's so subtle that almost nobody catches it. And, um, you know, I don't think, it, it, when the senators effectively are controlling the situation, I think it becomes dangerous for anyone who's a nominee to try and get into a fight 
with them. It's a difficult position to be in. And Kamala Harris, for example, former attorney general, she certainly knows the law. And it, I think it behooves any nominee to try and find a uh, more peaceful way of dealing with uh, to end the conversation. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> to, to, to exit to exit the conversation. Um, I don't. I I believe that he will end up with some Democrat votes on this one. Do you agree with that one? I think that's a reasonable uh, expectation. Not just because there's some Democrats who are in contentious battleground states and in elections this year. You know, the states that went for Trump. But also just simply because, as I said, I think this is a mainstream American jurist that there's not going to be much to hang your hat on if you want to oppose him. That's, again, getting back to your previous question, that's why if I were him, I would think about not wanting to be argumentative. You're trying to win these votes over. And if you take yeah. them on good faith, yeah. if, you yeah. do, if you try and be conciliatory, you might earn their vote where you might have assumed you weren't going to get it. Do you think at this point, um, since uh, he he got the, the nominee selection, that he's kind of going back through some of his old files and kind of refreshing some of the machinery of those decisions that, you know, he was part of so he can speak to um, the specifics that would cause some of the questioners' eyes to glaze over and they want to move on? Yeah, I think that's, that's you often see nominees do that, where they get a question where the questioner thinks they've really got you, but yeah. you're so prepared you can then come back with, as you just said, such detail that it crushes the moment that the questioner thought they had. You know, as attorneys, we're told when we ask a witness a question, we better know the answer. The answer already. But, right. But the senators oftentimes really don't have that luxury. If they get lucky enough that the witness isn't ready or the nominee isn't ready, then, yeah, they might get their moment in the sun where they gotcha. But those gotcha moments are pretty rare. And they haven't really come up that much in these uh, judicial nominee hearings that I can recall at the U.S. Supreme Court level. They certainly, we certainly have had some gotcha moments at the district court level. Um, are you expecting the confirmation hearing to happen before um, October the 1st? Or do you think that it will end up getting stretched out? You know, I suppose someone was saying to me that they think it's going to depend on, on, on each side's strategy. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, if I understand right, Mitch McConnell has canceled the August recess. So it would seem to me they should have time to vote on um, Kavanaugh's nomination before October 1st, which is the first day of the new term, which Pacific Legal, that new, that first week of the term will have two cases being heard, one of which we're definitively arguing, that's on Wednesday, October 3rd, the Nick property rights takings case. And and then another one, an Environmental uh, Endangered Species Act case called Warehouser, where I'm lead counsel for our clients. That's going to be argued on October 1st, and we're waiting to see whether Pacific Legal, who is a party to the case, will also participate in the argument. But either way, you know, you know, we are excited, regardless of who the nominee is, because we've got two strong cases, and whoever the judge is, we would expect that they would agree with the eminent logic and persuasion of our cases. But certainly we, we hope it's in front of a nine-justice court. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Mark Miller, Pacific Legal, and explaining all of these things. Uh, we, we love to hear it because it's kind of a black hole when things go into courtrooms and, and certainly with the Supreme Court. So thank you, Mark, for being with us and, and come back again soon. the truth the denise simon experience the truth matrix vetting exposing drilling down to the truth rolling thunder this is hitman see you at over hitman this is rolling thunder see you at out the denise simon experience exposing politics lies demagoguery spin fraud Press, Mike Charlie, 435-921, great to Mark, Mike Charlie, 473-9-89er, out. Promoting individual situational awareness, question, probe, notice, ask why. Mark Smoke on the deck, two rounds, AGBT, cast TOT, five, three. Simon experience. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen.
and gentlemen for staying with us here on the Denise Simon Experience. I'm going to really change gears here, um, kind of going over a little bit to the dark side, which um, we don't do very often, but I've got the distinct pleasure of having Abigail Esman with us. And I've been following her work over um, at the Investigative Project on Terrorism for quite some time. In fact, I follow all of their contributors' work over there. Um, because, uh, I mean, if, if for nothing else, it, it keeps things in somewhat the, the news flow that should be there. And Abigail is the author of Radical States. Uh, I think it was published in 2010. Is that right, Abigail? That's right. Yes. That's okay. Right. Well, congratulations on that, ladies and gentlemen. You, you can find that over on Amazon.com. Um, but Abigail's been kind enough to be with us um, to talk about I would call it a generational thing with um, child soldiers because that, that was her the basis of um, her piece over at the Investigative Project on Terrorism. So with that, Abigail, thanks for joining us on the Denise Simon Experience. Thank you for asking me. You know, I, I, I'm happy you wrote this. Um, it's, a, it's a terrible topic, um, but I'm happy you wrote it because it's, it's really something, Abigail, that, that uh, I would say – Nobody is really addressing. It's kind of like the 80-pound elephant in the room, and it, it, yet nobody knows what to do with it, either here in the United States or in Europe or I would even say in parts of Africa, maybe even you know Asia. And that is we've got a generational um, situation here with child soldiers. So, I mean, um, and I saw somebody not too long ago, probably a year ago, I think, that said – no, these wars are getting to be so ridiculous that my son is now fighting the same enemy I fought. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Think about that for a second. So, But that's really kind of the basis of your piece, isn't it? Well, it's a different situation. I mean, when you talk about my child, is I, I'm assuming that was an, a, an American soldier? Yeah, was an Afghan, yeah, an Afghan soldier. Yeah. So, you know, that that's a very different situation when you're talking about having wars that are so long that they're – um, crossing through generations, um, but the child soldier situation is, of course, about you know twelve year old kids who are being recruited by guerrilla groups and terrorist groups and even state groups um, to to fight as adult soldiers and being trained to do things like behead people and make bombs and um, do the things that, that, that soldiers would do on the battlefield, even though they are, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. So it's a different, is it, I think you're talking about two different things here. Well, it's um, true, but I mean, those, you know, in, in Afghanistan, I mean, what was once a child is now essentially right. a soldier there. So, I mean, they, they right. kind of grow up to that, to that, you know, time. But Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. And then they have children who... You know, they indoctrinate because they were indoctrinated. Um, and where so they the raised their children to be. I'm sorry? Yeah, where, does, where does this indoctrination really happen? Is it in in a mosque? Is it in some of these um, uh, guerrilla-type groups? Um, well, I think it it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it, it's different in, in every situation, in every country, with every group. Um, you know, a lot of what... What I found about Africa, for instance, is a lot of these children join um, join terror groups, join guerrilla groups, join radical groups, either because they themselves are fleeing a terrible situation at home or because their parents are enlisting them, basically, because, the, like, for instance, um, the Taliban and many groups also in Africa will pay pay a fee to the parents which they desperately need, or they will pay for the child's, excuse me, the child's welfare. They will take, send the kids to madrasas where they are indoctrinated in the schools, but they cover the education costs. And so very often parents will just send their kids out because they need the money, they want their kids to be educated, whatever it is, um, and, and the kids are indoctrinated once they join the groups. And, of course, in the case of ISIS, you have social media. Um, Abigail, there's really no one location, one battlefield that is distinctive necessarily from the other um, in all the usual battlefields, but that being 
you know, places in, in uh, North Africa and even in Yemen. Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if, if you mean in terms of the use of child soldiers, yes, yeah, I they, I mean, the 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 wars may be different, but the use of child soldiers, the abuse of children, um, particularly of young girls, yeah, that's you know maybe worse in some places than others, but it's basically the same thing. Um, well, the UN does a lot of reporting on this. Mm-hmm. Um, with, with different departments within the UN. Mm-hmm. And reporting is good because, I mean, it, 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 it tells us the conditions. But yet, between the United States and the UN, and I would say European leadership or even Middle Eastern leadership, they're very short and void on solutions, correct? Correct. I actually have been um, talking to the UN Security Council about this regarding... Um the, the children of ISIS and the returning children of ISIS coming back to Europe. Um, and the, there is no, there's no precedent for this. And every country has a different idea of what they should do. No one has done it for long enough to know whether or not any particular method is successful or not. So you have these children who are, on the one hand, victims of having been brought there or born there by their parents, um, and were indoctrinated simply because they happen to be small children in the Islamic State and have grown up in a war zone. Um, so on the one hand, they're victims. On the other hand, they're terrorists. I mean, they may be 10 years old, but they've been trained to be terrorists, and they've been trained to hate the West. They've been trained to hate everything that they are now moving into when they return to Europe. So what do you do with them? And there's no plan in place. There's no way to have a plan in place. And the UN, I think, is really struggling to come up with some kind of protocol, but we we have nothing to base this on. And the same thing, I think, is true with child soldiers everywhere in the world. There's just no... It's very difficult to know what to do with someone who is at one time dangerous and another time a victim. How do you now, protect yourself and protect that person at the same time? <laughs> a couple of years ago, um, John Kerry, at the time Secretary of State, when we were in the, the shank of the the real uh, war with Islamic State, he, he made a statement that said, you know, these people need economic opportunity, they need jobs. And all of us over here in the West kind of like rolled our eyes and goes, oh, give me a break. And I was one of those. <laughs> who, but now, who? Yeah, go ahead. The now, if you really get to the basis of it, they're based on what you said earlier that they're getting paid, and um, you know the the parents need salaries, and you know the economic, the education, whatnot. There is some truth to what he said, correct? You make a very good point. Um, yeah, I think there is. I think that as long as. Um, these communities are impoverished and will do anything they can to feed their children, there is a certain risk. Yeah. And, and, and the, you know, the terrorist groups know that, of course, and they prey on it. And so we have Islamic State. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of work with me here on this. We've, we've got Islamic State that, that uses them. We obviously have Hamas that, mm-hmm. that uses them. Um, we have the Taliban. We have... Um, Boko Haram, we have um, El Saib, we have, yeah, a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's it's something that, and, and, and what's interesting is, of course, some people argue that, well, you know, the, in, in the West you have child soldiers too because you can be, you can enlist by the age of 16 in some countries and 18 in our country, and is that really old enough? Mm-hmm. Um but this is, we're not talking about this. We're talking about children that there's no dispute that they are children. They're 10 or 11 years old. These are children. Um, and, and that was also, for instance, in Uganda. Um, so it's, it's, it's in many different countries. Colombia. Um, oh, yeah. It's in many different countries, and it's, it's a, a longstanding problem. This is nothing new, but I think it is getting worse not better, and with the ability of terrorist groups to reach, through social media, to reach young people um, and recruit them from abroad, it's a real 
increasing danger. Um, I, I, I'm not even sure if necessarily anything has been tried. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of talking past people and talking past solutions um, and talking about solutions, but I, I, I'm not convinced that um, some kind of solutions have necessarily been tried. You know, we've got the the U.S. State Department, um, mm -hmm. I would say for the last 10 years, if not more. We've got USAID. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got all these other special programs, Abigail, that have worked pretty hard at places like Somalia or Sudan or Congo and even Pakistan, Afghanistan, trying to replace jihad, if you will, generational jihad, with some other model for uh, growing some kind of an economic um, condition to replace this. And yet th there just doesn't seem to be enough success to try that model or expand that model, right? Well, I, I think there are various different models. You know, War Child has one, UNICEF has one. Um, there are different local groups that have had various varying measures of success. I don't think there is such a thing as a, as a template. Um, every community has different needs, different cultures, different ideas. Um, so I, I, I don't think there is something that you can just say, okay, this is what works and we're going to take this to Africa and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Colombia and the Congo and everybody will be fine. Sure. I, I definitely think it's something that has to be done on the ground. Um, the other thing is that there's no way to really know if it's successful or not because you, you can't, there are the children who are not joining, right? So you can't really say, well, maybe they actually prevented people from joining. There's no way to know that. The only thing that they can know is how many children they can de-radicalize. And de-radicalization programs in general are notoriously useless. Uh, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong, and I probably will, so you need to help me with it. <laughs> and that is that, isn't that Boko Haram, the, by virtue of the name, um, means no education or something? In other words, um, the, I don't know this. This is uh, something I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's why I think they were taking those schoolgirls, and you know, they they refused them education. Yet well, that's because they refuse. You know, these Islamic extremist groups refuse girls' education everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. Um, I mean, also, you know, also in 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 Iran, also in Saudi Arabia, also. You know the the abuse of women in in Islamic extremist groups is notorious, and one way to continue to abuse people and keep them oppressed is to not allow them to be educated. And yet, um, are these Abigail? Uh, are these jihadist groups? Are these? Uh, are they really satisfied with watching what is happening in? in Yemen with people starving to death or, you know, in in Somalia or, you know, the, 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 the human trafficking and, and stripping, you know, uh, kids and parents and, you know, from their homes and whatnot. I mean, it, 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 well, first, uh, first let's, let's, let's start with, they're not all jihadists, right? I mean, this is not only Muslims. This is also, you know, it's, it's all over. It's all kinds okay. of religions, the Lord's Resistance Army, all the, you know, it's, so it's not just Muslims. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure I understand the question. Do you mean do do extremist groups, jihadist groups in Afghanistan not approve of what's happening in Yemen? Is that well, I'm not I, sure I, I understand what you're the, saying? The, the point is, is that um, for instance, Boko Haram. I mean, what what or the Lord's Resistance Army? What to what end? You know, are they are they trying to improve something, or do or do they just want to be in forever conflict? No, I think you know you you go into a war because you're you're trying to achieve something, which is usually power. Um, so that you know this is all a matter of the ends justifying the means, and particularly when you are in 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 a cultural viewpoint that children who are killed on the battlefield are martyrs and heroes, it's a lot easier to send your child off to war, and and 
even congratulate yourself when when he's killed. I mean, so I, I don't think they're as horrified by it as you and I would be. Mm-hmm. Um, have you seen in your travels through, uh, you know, in, in your collaboration with the divisions of the United Nations and some of these other organizations that um, they are uh, applying any kind of solution, for instance, UNICEF or... or um, UNICEF has, I know UNICEF has programs in place in various different communities, and I think, again, those are, um, you know, those are specific to wherever they are. I don't think they're using the same programs in every country. Um, the the people that I've met with from the UN Security Council were researching what, you know, in the very early stages of researching what they hope will become a protocol that would be recommended by the UN Security Council, but they are at the very basic earliest stages of just pulling research together in order to figure out what the ideas could be that they could then elaborate. I mean, it's really early stages. But that's Um, specifically for ISIS. I should just point that out. Okay, fair enough. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with uh, Abigail Esman, who is the author of Radical States. Um, Trot on over to Amazon and grab that one. And she she is the contributor to um, the investigative project on terrorism. Um, just does some very very good work and kind of keeps things at least in some kind of conversation, which is why we ever today. Um, <laughs> Thank you. What is, let's talk about Hamas here for a second. Um, yeah. I would say uh, Hamas obviously is using the child soldiers, but Hezbollah isn't, or are they? Um, I, as far as I know, they are. Okay. All right. I don't see them generally in um, that conversation, but how does well, Hamas I know, explain? I know, for instance, that um, there's there's a, a, a Muslim activist in, in Belgium named Diab Abu Jaja. Maybe you've heard about him. I've written about him a bit. Um, and he was, at a very young age, um, working as a sort of, not a soldier, but he was on, on the field for Hezbollah. Whether or not he, that was official, I'm not sure, but cer- children certainly do join and do what they can. Let's just put it that way. I don't know how official their role may be. Those that were somewhat older, Abigail, um, that were, you know, childhood soldiers, and I mean, there are probably exceptions. You could probably count them on both hands that have left that whole model and become mm-hmm. normalized how many of them have have been interviewed that's that have spoken to what was the, was the pivot point that they decided to kind of leave that um there are a few there's actually a book that just came out um that was written by someone who did exactly that and and turned some he was a former um i think he was he was a, an, an isis a member of ISIS, and he he turned around and eventually actually turned some people in. Um, and you know there are there are extremists who have turned around and created programs for de-radicalization. Um, there's you know the Killiam Group in the UK. There's yes. Movement Sheikh in in Canada. So there there are quite a few. There are obviously nowhere near enough, um, but I think their voices do need to be heard. I think they do need to be broadcast widely and they should get the support of all of us and, and I mean they are they are literally now on the front lines against terror and at least thankful for that um, has any of, of the UN divisions had any kind of discussions with you know those I don't know <laughs> rather don't my know. success stories I mean I don't I mean, know we're, we're happy for them I mean that it, it shows that there's you know, some hope, but I, I, the, the numbers are not measuring up, um, and I'm not I'm not completely sure that reporting on all of this is. Uh, I mean, we have to talk about it, but I mean, I'm just so desperate for a solution, and um, I imagine you are as well. Correct, Abigail? Yes, indeed. Um, but you know, we we don't. Again, a, a solution isn't really anything we can have. There will be many solutions, and um, 
you know, it would yeah, be nice. Were- it would be nice if we could at least make some headway, and I'm not sure that we are. So, in that sense, I completely agree with you. Well, you you bring up a very good point because the solution in Somalia may not be the same solution that it would be successful in Pakistan or exactly. Sudan. Or, yeah, exactly, so, exactly. Um, but I think one thing that is probably universal is, and you sort of touched on this before, is the the matter of education. And if 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 the West can in some way um, sponsor and direct what education will be as opposed to leaving this gaping hole for extremist groups to come in and sponsor and determine the nature of education, that's going to make a huge difference. And I think that's one thing that we really do need to invest in in these kinds of countries um, because what, what children learn is who they become. And it's, it's us or them, really. I mean, who's going to teach these children? What are they going to teach them? And I know this has been going on, for instance, in, in, um, in, in the Palestinian territories. A lot of um, Western countries are now starting to sponsor education for exactly that reason. But I think it needs to be done much more and much more broadly. Well, I see, you know, I see some desperations, um, I mean, because otherwise we're going to be at this another 17, 18, 20 years, um, yeah. and that, I, I would say that into itself is a sign of failure, um, because we, mm-hmm. we can predict that it's going to be with us a very long time, right? <laughs> Sadly, yes. I think so. Well, I appreciate, you know, the good work and um, that on that you're doing and in, in calling some attention to this. And I hope by uh, being on the Denise Simon experience that, uh, you know, it gets some people thinking and raising their eyebrows and maybe there's some so. creativity. And um, I hope so. But I do also really want to emphasize that, you know, these are not, these are kids who are both victims and, yeah. and terrorists. They are in a, in a terrible position and, and the, we we need to have some humanity for their situation and not just assume that they're all going to kill us and we have to kill them back. It's it's much more complex than that, and probably we will do better by showing sympathy towards them and towards the situations that create them than we would by showing hostility. I think the more hostility we show to children like this, the more we're going to pay for it. Well said. Um, thank you, Abigail Esmer, for being with thank us on the you so much. experience and keep up the good work. Ladies and gentlemen, more coming your way. You are about to join Don Newen co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio, and Denise Simon, host of the Denise Simon Experience, for a weekly situation report, or sit rep. 18 hours a day, Denise Simon lives her life as an intel analyst. 18 hours a day, Don Nguyen lives his life in the world of rock and roll. One hour each day, Nguyen receives a daily sit rep from Simon. Welcome to the Drive Time Situation Report. Fasten your seatbelt. You are now in Don Nguyen's car, and he is calling in for his sit rep. Check the Talk America Radio schedules for showtimes at talkamericaradio.us. Let me talk to you, black people. When you vote for blacks and put them in office under the banner of the Democrat Party, please explain to me what black people get as a result. This was not a nap that we have been taking. We are in a coma. You know what the interesting thing about pensions is? That's today's money given to people who ain't doing nothing for you today. Get off that black Democrat tit that they've been sucking on. Your country is being stolen from you, and the promise is being stolen from your children, and they're telling you it's all right, while the rest of the world is trying to lap us. Well, why are we doing so poorly? Two words, teachers' unions. Are you kidding me? Black Man Thinking, Monday nights, 9 p.m. 
Hi, this is Donna Fiducia, co-host of Cowboy Logic Radio. For 28 years, I was in the mainstream media, most recently as an anchor at the Fox News Channel. No more. Ladies and gentlemen, the mainstream media has completely failed the American people. Radio networks like Talk America Radio will not fail you. Radio shows like Cowboy Logic Radio will not fail you. Check out the entire roster of over 60 weekly radio shows by visiting TalkAmericaRadio.us. That's TalkAmericaRadio.us. Thanks for staying with us here on the Denise Simon Experience, ladies and gentlemen. Very happy that you could uh, uh, stay with us. Um, I've got the distinct pleasure of having a buddy with us, um, Trevor Loudon, who is a successful filmmaker and author and the owner of the website TrevorLoudon.com. And if, if I mean, world travelers here, um, he and, and Victoria uh, doing the work that we all should be doing. Um, but nonetheless, at least some of it's getting done. Uh, he's, he's out on the road now um, doing some hard work. So with that, Trevor, thanks so much for being with us on the Denise Simon Experience. Uh, look, always a pleasure, Denise. No, no problem at all. You're sweet. Um, look, we, we had this crazy... Uh, whatever her name is, Vic, uh, uh, whatever, I forget now. It's a long one. It's got three or four hyphens o- in o- it. Ocasio. Yeah, her. Ocasio-Cortez. Yes, yes. Her. That's the one. The, the pretty much unseated uh, Congressman Crowley, I think in the uh, one of the uh, Bronx districts of New York. Yeah, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx. Bronx yeah, 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 whatever. Um. And so this has given rise to yet a constant and growing movement here in the United States. Uh, And then we have certainly seen in London with the protests against uh, Donald Trump's visit there, um, that, that protest was massive. I mean, there were in fact thousands and thousands that were there. I have a, a buddy of mine who was actually in London, and um, he went down to kind of get in the middle of it and found that the two largest groups that were protesting against um, President Trump was Stop the War Coalition and the Socialist Workers Party. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Trevor, I mean, are, are, are governments like the, the government of, of the UK the Brits caring less than we are. I mean, even our own government. I mean, it's it's really just so curious to me. Well, if you look at Britain, you know, you got you got London, a city of more than twenty million people, with a Muslim Marxist mayor. Um, you have got a, a, a huge socialist contingent there. You know, the the stop the uh, the stop Trump coalition had members of the Communist Party of Britain. The Socialist Workers Party, um, the Labour Party, all involved. So it isn't hard when you've got all those communist groups and Labour Party groups in a city of 20 million people to get, say, 10,000 people on the street. But, you know, if you go and talk to a a British taxi driver, you know, or the voice of the people, the the mood is much different. The attitude is usually very pro-President Trump, actually. Yeah. So this is just more Marxist propaganda, you know, the, these, uh, the mass movement. You know, just, just like the Women's March, you know, on, on the day of the after Trump's inauguration in Washington, D.C., where they got a million women, women into downtown D.C. 
Well, you know, that was led by the Communist Party USA, Democratic Socialist of America, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. And you can guarantee you that 95% of the women there wearing this silly hat had no idea who was manipulating them or who was leading them. And so um, you've got to take all this with a grain of salt. You know, the Tea Party used to get two or three million people into Washington Mall, you know, who would come from all over the country and pay their own way. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got, you've got in this country all these left-wing groups that pay their people to attend, that, that have a, a renter mob that can get out numbers for almost any event. So um, it's very deceptive. But the, but the, real, the point is these are all Marxist, communist-led groups. And they are very, very upset that there's finally a US president that is undoing some of their agenda. So yes, they are going to come out and protest in big numbers. And the bigger the numbers, that means the more we have to double down and uh, push our agenda and not let our voice get drowned out by the, um, by the Marxist protesters. What was curious is not only in London, here in the United States, if you really look at the profile, the, the age group, um, it really speaks to this next generation that our generation is going to have to deal with because um, this is, it's clearly a, um, it's, not, it's not going away. In fact, I would argue that it's necessarily manifesting itself. So we've, we've got a generational issue here that we're going to have to undo or attempt to undo, correct? Yeah, well, well, we have. You know, in some aspects, the um, millennial generation is very conservative. There are probably more conservatives than the millennials than there have been in any generation for a long time. But there's also a very big Marxist socialist component as well. But, but it, that is deceptive too. Um, y- you know, they've, they've done surveys where, where, you know, they'll say to kids, you know, do you support socialism? And 40% of the kids will say yes. And then they'll rephrase the question, you know, do you support a system where a large part of the income that you work for is given to people who don't work? And and uh, <laughs> the percentage goes down, you know, way, way down. But uh, I had an interesting conversation um, at the People's Summit in Chicago two years ago. Now, that was a, a big gathering of about 3,000 communists, Bernie Sanders supporters, the Workers' World Party was there, Socialist Alternatives, International Socialist Organization, um, Democratic Socialists of America, Communist Party USA. And I had a, a conversation with Carl Davidson, who was an old member of the SDS. He was the leader of the SDS. He was the leader of the League of Revolutionary Struggle, then the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, and now he's a DSA. And and he said to me, I was talking to him about 1968, and I said, Carl, you were there in 68. You know, the students were protesting. France almost fell to the communists. Uh, all over the Western world was major upheaval. Do you see anything like that on the horizon? He said, yeah, look, 68 is just around the corner. But this time it's going to be so much bigger and so much better. And I, I said, why is, it, why is that, Carl? And he said, well, back in the 60s, it was just us crazy kids. America was conservative. America was patriotic. But, after, but we've had 40 years in the universities to teach the kids about Marxism, and that's going to pay off for us. And, he, and he's right. So, you know, we, we do have a, a, a big problem, and, and we've got a lot, lot more conservative kids coming through, but we've got a heck of a lot more socialist ones as well. And, and, uh, and we've got that socialist cohort um, from the 60s and the 70s that's now leading the unions is leading the Democratic Party, which is leading the um, uh, you know, academia, and they want their revolution before they die, and they are using this new cohort of kids to bring that about. So, yeah, America is living in a pre-revolutionary situation right now. 
but they're also getting some help from from adversarial countries um, that at the academia level, and that is Russia and China. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'll add another one too. Well, and also the communist parties of Europe. Uh -huh. So you got the Chinese, um, Latin American communists, and and the Russians are all interfering. Um, are all actively interfering in American elections and American universities um, to push their agenda. I know that um, at least Senator Marco Rubio has, you had to kind of pay attention, but he was out there going after the, uh, I think it's called the Confucius Institute. Yeah, yes, yes. And, well, yeah. He, he he put a couple of uh, university campuses and deans and chancellors on notice and said, I highly recommend that you get these institutes out of your universities. I think um, the last I looked, and it's been a while, Trevor, that it, uh, two or three of them did comply. They would they but but nobody realized nobody was paying enough attention. Least of all. You know the leadership or the the management or you know the top brass of these universities on what the Confucius Institute was. They were just happy to take the money. Well, a Confucius Institute, and, and, and you've got this in the Islamic um, situation too, where yeah. they're, they're setting up tiers of Islamic studies, um, massively funded by from Saudi Arabia, etc., in Qatar. Who are basically um, promoting Islam and and a left wing version of Islam at, at that in college campuses? The Confucius Institute uh, institutes are spreading right across college campuses right now. They they're basically endowing chairs, they're endowing chairs, and setting up these institutes, uh, bringing in lots of Chinese students, and and pushing the communist Chinese propaganda line. On the college campuses, and so you know, this puts any conservative academic at a university in a in a in a bind because if they want to come out and criticise Chinese policy, which is richly deserving of criticism, they've got to realise that there's an institute on their campus that is putting huge amounts of money onto that campus, and their university chancellors are not going to be very pleased about that. And they just might be advised to shut their mouth, and so so you get this chilling effect right across the all across the university campuses. You basically it's basically like like Hitler setting up some Nazi institutes and in college campuses all across America in 1938. That, that's what the moral equivalent of these these are Trojan horses for America's number two enemy. You know, right across the United States, uh, this is just insane to allow this. Well, it's clearly festering. But what is, Trevor? Um, what is particularly curious is that we do have checks and balances. Meaning, um, we've got government agencies that uh, are are there for these checks and balances. Uh, we've got the IRS um, because they end up with you know some kind of nonprofit status. Um, and then we, we certainly have the investigative wing. And, you know, what is particularly fascinating is if you go to a diplomatic post, wherever it be in the United States, uh, across the world, and you apply to get a visa, there's a question on there about have you ever participated in, you know, uh, you know, communist activities and so forth and so on. Now, I don't know if that is a disqualifier or not, but that question's still there. So there well, are I, the absolutely. I I, I, had, I had to sign that that I'd never been involved in, when I to get a green card to come here. Uh -huh. I had to sign that I'd never been involved in any communist or fascist organization which sought to overthrow the United States Constitution. <laughs> well, you, you know, that's not that's there's ample grounds to kick these people out of the country. Because that's what they're doing. Absolutely it's what they are doing. But, you know, the, the college campuses um, get lots of money for this. And there doesn't seem to be that the will, the political will from the Justice Department or the IRS or, or the FBI to go after these institutions. 
Well, I think that there's probably case files on some on these people, but then it's gonna it's it's is, is it a priority thing? Is it a resource thing? Is it a is it you know? Um, well, well, I, I think it's also a sympathy thing. I think um, you have a a situation in the justice department certainly, which is controlled largely by leftists, and and we clearly see that situation in the uh, in the FBI today as well. And, and it's been a, a problem in the CIA for some time, that you have leftists in positions of authority. Well, why would they go after other leftists? You know, when they've got the Tea Party to hammer, you know, or, or, or Trump supporters. Why why are they going to go after their, their co-religionists? So um, you, you, we've got a, we've got a, our, our security systems services have been penetrated at very high levels. What is the are, are these groups? Um, you know the the answers. Uh, Stop the war coalition. You know socialist party. Uh, socialist workers party. Are they collaborating with each other in that leadership? And they all kind of meet in a Chicago once a year type deal. Um, or uh, are, are they just kind of holding hands and saying, you go take on this part and we'll go take on that part? Well, there's, there's a bit, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of collaboration. Um, you've got basically two, two lefts in America. Broadly speaking, you have two lefts. One is a pro-democratic party left and one is an anti-democratic party left. Now, in the pro-democratic party left, you have Communist Party USA, Democratic Socialists of America, even though there is some division in that group on, on that issue, um, the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, Left Root, and the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, the people behind Black Lives Matter. So they are allied in what they call the left, the, in, the left inside out strategy. They have a formal alliance that they are working together to penetrate and influence the Democratic Party, the Progressive Caucus, etc. So they've got about 50,000 members combined between the, the five groups. Mm. And they are working together in a formal alliance right now to take over the Democratic Party. And that's succeeding. The Ocasio-Cortez victory in New York was just a, a little tip of the iceberg on what they're doing. But you've also got, then you've got the the other left, which incorporates the Workers' World Party, Party for Socialism and Liberation. Workers' World Party are pro-Iran, pro-Russia, pro-North Korea. They're the people who've been ripping down Confederate statues in the South, for instance. And uh, they work together with Socialist Alternative and the Freedom, and, and the other branch of Freedom Road Socialist Organization, there are two freedom pro socialist organizations. One is anti-democratic party, one is pro-democratic party. And, and they all work together and they work with the Russians and the North Koreans and the Chinese and the Cubans. And they are the ones you tend to see on the more violent street protests. They are the ones who rip down statues. They are the ones that, that you know, invade college campuses and that kind of thing. So you've got a left, a communist left working with and inside the Democratic Party and a street level communist left. But both of these factions are working with the Chinese and East uh, European communist parties um, and Latin American communist parties. So you've got a division of labor. You know, you've got the people who pretend to be moderate, work with the Democrats and the people who are out there on the streets and they're the ones who will say, we hate Obama, we hate the Democrats. Um, and and, and that, gives, they get, that gave Obama a bit of cover, saying, look, the left hates me, so I can't be one of them. Yeah. But Obama, Obama was on the Democrat communist side of things, and the Workers' World Party and other types of organisations would happily criticise Obama, even though he was fulfilling their agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Trevor Loudon, and you can find his work over at trevorloudon.com. Um, so, Trevor, he, here's the deal: we're going we're gonna to schedule a congressional hearing, and I guess we'll use the Department of Homeland Security Committee that would host the the hearing. 
on all of these groups and we would if if any of the leadership of any of these uh, dsas or cpusas want to show up all fine um and we hold these hearings would this end up being according to the media because the media obviously is sympathetic to this would they brand this whole thing as a as a modern day McCarthy operation? Of course they would. You know they are. <laughs> they and I think that's why um, it's the Republicans and, and etc. have been very reluctant to go after these yeah. people. I think there's two reasons. One is they have very little clue what these people are doing. They really don't understand what they're up against, and they're terrified of. You know, it's like it's it's a big challenge for the GOP to like. Um, I, I've got to commend your Florida congressman the other day. Um, what's his name? The guy from Jacksonville who held the Islamic um, Ron DeSantis. Oh, Ron DeSantis, DeSantis. governor. Yeah, uh -huh. who held hearings in Congress the other day about the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, that's hard enough for them to do, which should be an absolute no-brainer because the Muslim Brotherhood is so patently, obviously, a terrorist-supporting organisation. So they held hearings on that. But to actually go a little bit further and hold hearings on communist groups, etc., I think most Republicans would shirk at that, A, because they don't understand that their enemies in this country are mainly communists, and that they would be terrified of, of being labelled as McCarthyists. Well, you know, they, they don't have that option, really. They, they sign an oath to defend the Constitution from enemies, foreign and domestic. They don't get to decide which enemies are comfortable to deal with and which are uncomfortable to deal with. They should be um, going after America's enemies. But, you know, the, the, this is a real... Where America is truly in a pre-revolutionary situation. The Democratic Party is now controlled by Marxists. Much of the media is, the union movement is, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, um, the Muslim Brotherhood are all working in there together and they are trying to create chaos in American streets and push this country into violence. Um, so they are a huge threat and, and we've got to see some congressmen and senators with enough balls to take them on. Well, we at least have, uh, I think there's three signatures. Uh, Congressman um, Pete King out of New York is, is one of them on the, uh, what is it, the Unmasking Antifa Act of 2018. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, you know, at least yeah. it's something. Now, it's only been introduced. It hasn't gotten anywhere. Um, but I would, I would say, Trevor, then where is the Heritage Foundation? Where's the Cato Institute? Where's the Hoover Institute? You know, where are even a RAND report? Where are these people that have done these kinds of studies that, um, you know, I really Look, question. The, Her the, Her the Heritage Foundation is so compromised by China, it is useless on matters of national security. You know, when when uh, Rick Fisher some years ago uh, wrote a report in the Heritage Foundation, he was a China expert, still is, um, wrote a report warning on Chinese military buildup, he was fired. On the oh, by basically through the agency of Elaine Chow, who was serving on the Heritage Board at the time, and is now Trump's Secretary of Transport and married to Mitch McConnell. You know that woman. If she's not a Chinese agent, she may as well be. She's got so many family connections to the Communist Party of China. So the Heritage Foundation is so <coughs> enthralled by free trade with China that they will not do anything to threaten that. They will not take any action against China. They will not criticize China at all. So that's a major conservative think tank that's basically neutralized on that issue. And, and, and you'll find that a big chunk of the Republican Party is, is, is the same way. Um, there's an organization in America called the Council of 100. And it's about 150 top Chinese American academics, um, politicians, um, journalists, business people, etc., who form a lobby group for China. And they have people like Corey, um, uh, what's his name, Corey? Uh, this is a senator from uh, Colorado, the Republican. 
uh, Cory Gardner. Cory Gardner Sorry. will go to their events. Ed Royce, the congressman, retiring congressman of California, would go to their events. Oh. Um, they have several Republicans compromised. Yes, they work more with the Democrats. It's purposeful. But they, it is. They, they, it's an influence operation. This is a major Chinese influence operation in America, and it was actually set up on the uh, on the advice of Henry Kissinger, no less, that, that functions as China's arm in America right now. And it has a whole bunch of Republican congressmen involved with it, a whole bunch of Democrats involved with it, including, I might say, Adam Schiff um, out of California, who was leading the charge on the, the Trump as a Russian agent meme. Yeah, so you, 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 you've got a big, a, a huge Chinese influence, Chinese political influence operation going on in this country right now. And they've given a lot of money to, to various congressmen and senators to, to, to give the Chinese cover. So um, that, that's a big problem. Well, you, you, you Trevor, <laughs> maybe we, <laughs> it's kind of a scary topic. I mean, we, talk, we can talk about scary topic, but this is a scary one. Um, you laid it out very well. Uh, we certainly are, are very gratified with your, your knowledge and your presentation on this. Uh, now that we've kind of um, explained it and, and how penetrated it all is, um, maybe we ought to go start knocking on some doors in, in uh, uh, halls of Congress up on the hill and say, what, what are you doing about it? Um, well, you know, some I, I, of those might be, you know, you know, Mike, Mike Lee, uh, Ted Cruz, um, uh, you know, Ted, uh, uh, Marco Rubio, um, Ron DeSantis. I mean, at, at least some of them yeah. are, are trying to sound a little bit of a clarion call here, but, um, uh, you know, I, I can imagine what the what the backside uh, consequence is. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please go over and visit uh, TrevorLoudon.com. You can find a lot of that good work over there. Um, and, Trevor, we're so delighted to have you with us on the Denise Simon Experience. Travel well. Yeah, well, look, look, we'll come back sometime. I, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Democratic Socialist America and their ties to the former East German Communist Party. For instance, Indeed. Very yeah, well. deep. So, look, any time. Thank you. And thanks, uh, ladies okay. and gentlemen, for being with us on the Denise Simon Experience.